Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Bald Explorer Live. I'm live on the 15th of June, 2020. And this is a reading live session. And we're carrying on with the reading of the story of a Norfolk farm by Henry Williamson. Um, hello to the lovely Julia. Hello to Linda Kane. Hi, Rich and Julia. Hope you're both well. Glad you managed to get to see your parents, Julia. Absolutely. And hello to Ben Reeve. Nice to see you. We're going to carry on with this reading of this uh, remarkable book. Um, I did have an email, actually, which gave some interesting information about it. Um, I meant to have that prepared to to uh, read out but I haven't got it to hand I just wonder if I can get whilst we're waiting for people to come along uh, let's just see if I can uh, find that particular email uh, of course I'm not going to be able to oh, hang on so this came in from uh, a gentleman called Edward and he says, I'll read the email out because it's uh, worth reading. He says, uh, listening to the story of a Norfolk man prom prompted a little quest of my own research into Henry Williamson and the background to the book. Um, so for those interested, oh, hang on. So his wife was Lo Lo Letitia. Now, I couldn't pronounce it. Um, Letitia, I think is how he, I kept calling it Letitia. Letitia. Uh, bloody words and their pronunciations. Um, Henry Williamson uses throughout the medieval, not American, as some people have suggested, spelling of plough, P-L-O-W, for plough, P-L-O-U-G-H. This is not just idiosyncratic but points to the well-known use of that spelling in the 14th century poem The Vision of Piers Plowman uh, by William Langland. This poem is a series of narratives which show the corrupt state of the world and an attempt to remedy it by creating an ideal society which seems to be a continuing theme on his mind. Chapter 5 opens with philosophical thoughts about truth. Is that right? I don't know which chapter we're on at the moment. Chapter 6. Uh, there's a word called Malkin, which is an old word for scarecrow, so we might come into that. And Lucerne is Alf... Uh, sorry, alf alpha, alf al alfalfa or something, uh, used as a hay crop, which, as well as a long term for improving green manure. Okay, so, and d the Dick character, his mate Dick, seems to refer to Richard de la Mare, son of Walter de la Mare. Um, so anyway, so there we go. Uh, so thank you very much to Edward for those facts. Now, I can't remember where we were. I hope you're all well. Um, welcome to Mark Eastwood, to Jada Jones. Um, shopping, <laughs> it resembles rioting, oh dear. Tim Williams, hi Richard. Tim, I've got your video to download for tonight's show. Um, I work in a supermarket, lot busier lately, oh golly. Um, I need to go and do some shopping at some point. With people out of work and losing their jobs, makes you wonder where the cash is coming from. Well, this is it. Maybe it's all from the furlough money. Don't worry, they'll all be paying it back soon enough, won't we? Now, I don't want to drop things on my desk. So, I can't remember. I'm driven by an idea. Oh, hang on. Yes, this is where we got to. We were talking about seven pillars of the world. Oh yes, and he quotes he quotes seven pillars of the world. So he's looked at the farm. He's had a, ga a gouge a gouge a, a gander at the farm, a 
And he says, I want to do something. Words were not enough. What, because he's a writer, what had Lawrence written in his Seven Pillars of Wisdom and then in another mood taken out of the final version? What indeed? Oh, there's Edward. Good afternoon, Edward. Just read your email that you sent to me out. Thank you for that, with various different references. So this is a quote from Seven Pillars of Wisdom by Lawrence of Arabia. Well, not Lawrence of Arabia. T.E. Lawrence, wasn't it? This, therefore, is a faded dream of the time when I went down into the dust and noise of the eastern marketplaces and with my brain and muscles, with sweat and constant thinking, made others see my vision coming true. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their minds wake in the day to find that all was vanity. Well, we've all done that, haven't we? Had a dream and or woken up and thought, I've got a great idea. And then in the, in the uh, harsh light of daylight, you go, oh, no, no, it was a silly idea. We've all done that. But the dreamers of, of the day are dangerous men, for they may act their dream with open eyes and make it possible. This I did. I meant to make a new nation, to restore the world, a lost influence, to give 20 million Semites the foundation on which to build an inspired dream pa place, palace of their national thoughts. So high an aim called for the inherent nobility of the minds and made them play a dangerous part in events. But when we won it, it was charged against me that the British petrol loyalties in Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia were becoming dubious and French colonial policy ruined in the Levant. I'm afraid that I hope so. We pay for these things too, much in humour and innocent lives. We were casting them by thousands into the fire to the worst of deaths, that the corn and the rice and the oil of Mesopotamia might be ours. Um, yes. Anyway, I think that's reference to um, after the, as far as I remember, after the First World War, a lot was promised to the Arabs to so that they would, there was a sort of Arab spring, Arab ri rising, and they, and the British wanted them on their side so that they wouldn't go on the side of the, um, the other empire that was around, what was it called before it died? Not the, uh, well, the Turks, I suppose. Anyway, so the, he's he's he wants to do something. Letitia, he says. Uh, Letitia, 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 Letitia. Shall we buy the farm? I think I have just enough work. I, I sorry, I have just enough to work it. When mother, do you think me callous? Oh, when mother dot dot dot, do you think me callous to mention it? No, dear, I'm sure she would understand. She only wants you to be happy. Blimey, this Letitia's just sort of, um, yeah, yeah, do whatever you like, you know, take your mother's money and <laughs> buy, buy a farm. We don't know the first thing about farming, but that's fine. I feel I could succeed. I can always write and earn the capital we need. Letitia paused in her knitting. You've worked very hard, you know. Do you think it would be too much of a strain, all this business details, I mean? Perhaps you're right. If only I had someone who could act out my ideas. I know. How about Sam? Sam? She looked surprised. I waited for her to say something impatiently. She knitted slowly. Well? She frowned to herself, bit her lip. At length, with a mild, with a mild desperation, she said... I'm not against your idea. You always think I'm against your impulses, don't you? Actually, I'm considering what to say. Do you think Sam would be the right person? He's so different from you. He was, but that was 12 years ago. Since then, he's been in Africa and made good. He commands men, doesn't he? Anyone who went out there without a penny and worked his way up must be all right. How about sending him an airmail letter? You like him, don't you? You and he get on well. Then in time I could leave the farm to you and him and perhaps travel and be free to write. It's a fine idea, isn't it? Letitia 
I felt, was always disappointingly slow. She seldom shared my enthusiasms. I know that feeling so well when I would come up with ideas with ex-partners and say, hey, what about we, I do this? What about... And they kind of go, hmm. <laughs> and so I know that feeling when you all you want your partner is to say, yes, my darling, it's such a good idea. Uh, 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 <laughs> anyway, she seldom shared my enthusiasms. I knew that though she... I knew that she thought slower than I did and was less impulsive, as I knew she would never, uh, as I knew that she would never get into or cause trouble. The objective artist in me saw her qualities of patience, tolerance, and simple endurance. Had I not, oh, limbed limbed her in character in Mary Ogilvy, the pathway. There's a word I don't know. L-I-M-N-E-D, limbed. But the personal or superficial self was too often impatient and violently critical of her calm, which I then saw as slowness, even sloth, and her lack of immediate response to ideas as lack of imagination. Yes, I'm afraid I'm, I'm also guilty of that. Sam, her brother, had been like her in this, tenderly sympathetic, always ready to work for others, entirely without a thought of personal gain, even to the point of loss to himself. It was their family nature to be gentle, complete without interference in the lives of others. Indeed, they had seemed to unknowing of the striving of the world about them. As children, they lived in the remote Devon countryside with a few friends, happy and self-contained as a family, their mother had died when they were children, and an old father had lived with them, shut away from life since the death of his young wife. He was the rare type of man who loves but once, and then forever. Letitia frowned. I don't know, she replied slowly, while the colour mounted in her cheeks. Don't think me unsympathetic, she went on hurriedly, but I'm wondering if you and Sam could work together. You're so utterly different types. I know we vex you with our slowness. I don't want you to be vexed. It was only occasionally Letitia and I talked together like this. I felt a flow between us when she spoke her mind. Usually she was afraid of venturing any opinion, lest it be the cause of upset between us. The idea became happy in my mind as I outlined a rosy future wherein Sam would be managing the farm and saying to me as he met me by the pig house wearing breeches and leggings while I dismounted from my horse and gave the reins to one of the men. I've just made out the balance sheet, old boy. We've uh, made nearly 300 last year. Not bad, as you say, but next year we'll double it. I heard my reply, as with calm eyes and sunburnt cheeks, I struck my riding boot with a short and knobbly uh, malka, malaka cane. Oh, that's fine. I must go away soon. I, they've asked me to ride a couple of films in Hollywood, and there's the land adjoining us in the market. We could do another couple of hundred acres, don't you think? Land's never been so cheap for the last five last hundred and fifty years, you know. Well, old boy, you provide the land and we'll provide the work for it, and we'll get coombs and the cattle uh, for the grading out of the boxes. As he spoke, the children galloped up on ponies, freedom and ease, with which I had never thought to exist in the world. There was at the old father, gardening in a tweed suit, carefully kept and used in the 19th century, a grey hunting pot hat on his head to keep the sun off his eyes. There were three brothers, shy but friendly, listening but seldom replying, and indeed knowing what to say in reply, to the theories and ideas about the causes of the world war, which poured out by myself, an unknown stranger with a racing motorcycle, who had come into their house to stay apparently as a friend of their sister's. They accepted him as one of themselves without reservation or question. I think this is this is his delusion, isn't it? 
I slept in the hammock under the elm tree in the garden, or in the wooden chalet on the lawn, in which their mother had died some years before the war. The brothers are keen on engineering and somehow got a contract for making parts of battery-making machines. These brass parts they turned on a treadle lathe, often working all night to get the job done. The lathe belonged to their father, who had amused them in his workshop during intervals of otter hunting and shooting in pre-war days before his brewery shares and Russian stock had declined to almost nothing. And then he had to and then had to be sold to pay for his life his wife's long illness. When first I knew them they were poor but happy, knowing little about money which came from the family solicitors or even why it did not come sometimes. I used to visit them on my motorcycle, a sack of rabbits over my shoulder and a spaniel dog sitting aside the petrol tank between my knees. I took my cat too, a small black and white mother cat called Pie. She used to ride with the rabbits, and although she meowed plaintively the first time, she soon got used to it. What a grand family we were, I thought. What merry evenings we had in the little sitting room. In the armchair sat old Papa, though of course I didn't call him that, reading his threepenny bloods the thrilling adventures of Sexton Blake, the detective, and his assistant Tinker, which he bought at the railway station after returning from otter hunting. Letitia and I and Sam on the sofa, which was broken in one corner, reading or playing Ludo, while one brother sat in the wicker chair and read, and the other moved about until someone got up and left the room, when on his return... when on return... His or her place was likely to be filled. Copies of ancestral portraits by Gainsborough looked down from the walls on the, on the family eating supper of shrimp paste sandwiches and coffee made from a shop-bought brown liquid in a bottle. Sounds like camp coffee to me. What freedom these innocent people had from the worldliness which spoilt so many grown-up men and women, I thought. Many times I told myself of the good for fortune to be among such simple and sweet people. And as for Lotitia, she was, she was beautiful as De Desmelda. Desdemona, I beg your pardon. She was a Shakespearean heroine in the flesh. O oh, fortunate author to have found among the post-war bitterness, disillusion and hatred, a family whose modesty and simple kindnesses was entirely natural. My periodic arrivals with the sack were in, invariably greeted with a by Jove, that looks good, from Sam, the least expressive one of the family, though roars of laughter would come from Papa. Is it Papa? Do we say Papa or do we say Papa? I never quite... I suppose it is Papa. From Papa as the... It's just such, a, such an old word. Uh, as the small cat dishevelled and... Bes what, roars of laughter would come from Papa as the small cat dishevelled and bewildered was shaken out of the sack with the rabbits. While the boys were working at the treadle lathe in Papa's workshop, I skinned the rabbits and dissected them for the pot, helping Letitia in the kitchen afterwards scrubbing out her larder, the haunt of another cat with kittens, and swabbing the scullery floor and scouring the sink. We washed up together, and I tried to get some sort of method into the place. Letitia cooked for the four of men, for the four men, made the beds and cleaned the rooms, and also did all the washing of clothes. Her happy disposition and equal mind prevented her from feelings of unhappiness or frustration that most of her work seemed to come continually to naught. Always there were piles of washing and mending, including Papa's white breeches and hunting socks. The boys did not keep their bedrooms tidy. Everything was scattered about. Though Papa was always methodical, everything in its special place 
both in his bedroom and in his library, where daily he entered upon the data of rainfall, temperature, wind direction in his meteorological charts. I used to bring rabbits over because when I first knew them, they had no food in the house. They lived on potatoes or bread and cheese. Their cat used to sit up, up at the table with them, and also a tame robin flew in the window and perched on Papa's head to the old gentleman's annoyance. So the boys made a neat wire netting frame to fit over the open window, behind which the robin used to flutter, stittering with, a with rage and pecking to come in amongst his friends. Their cat liked currants, and every mealtime would put a paw delicately, nervously, over the somewhat grimy edge of the tablecloth where cuffs greasy from lathe work had pressed, and try to hook with her claws a small round hole in the cloth, which looked like a currant. It was one of her tricks to take currants with a curved paw and eat them on the edge of the table with her head on one side. Every mealtime the hole in the tablecloth used to provide amusement for all the family. Maybe that was one of the reasons why the tablecloth remained there week after week. When Papa died, the boys and Letitia called them, oh, the boys, as Letitia called them, would have some money from the trust fund of her parents' marriage settlement. One of them had an idea. How about trying to get some of that money now? Only a little part of it, of course, about a, a hundred pounds. It was fatiguing work pushing on the tread lathe hour after hour. Now, with a hundred pounds, one could buy an oil engine and two more lathes and turn out more work. Keen on the idea, they went to see a lawyer. Certainly, said the lawyer, he could make inquiries on their behalf. The inquiries were so thorough that in less than a week he gave them good news that much more than a hundred could be arranged, if they liked. Why not sell all of their revisions? They would then, they would, uh, then they would have nearly three hundred pounds with which they could enlarge their engineering shops more profitably. They thought him an awfully nice fellow to have taken such trouble for them and agreed that it would be fine to have a big works in their garden, right by the house, so convenient for business. So they signed the document, and a few months later, when Letitia left to share the precious, precarious life of a... Sorry, so a few months later, when Letitia left to share the precarious life of an unknown and unconventional author, building began. They gave the job to a small local builder to help them. There was no contract, no price agreed between them. When the building was finished, the little builder hired a cab, bought a barrel of beer and drove around the town visiting his friends. For a whole week the little man celebrated. The dream of his life had come true. Suddenly he had a lot of money. As for the boys, Inexperience and trust in human nature had resulted in a factory being erected with walls of only a single brick in thickness. Part of those walls fell down and had to be rebuilt. Only the roof held, together, held them together, and this had cost about £1,600. But when the fire insurance inspector came to look over the completed building, he said that in the event of a total Sorry, he said that in the event of a total loss, his company would indemnify with them, sorry, indemnify them only to the full value of the building, which was £600. Workmen had been engaged, machinery ordered. The blacksmith's son, a lad of 14 years, was given the job as apprenticed and most generously paid 20 shillings a week. Elsewhere, the parents of apprentices had to pay for their sons learning and, and to be mechanics, and the money they paid was returned as weekly wages. But Sam had been an apprentice for a brief while to a local ironmonger and had sympathy for the hard lot. The boys 
also had sympathy for commercial travellers who went from place to place, often without getting a single order. Also, the things that they had to sell were all likely to be useful to Cobold to the Cobold Brothers. Sparking plugs, for instance. Now that, now that motoring was on the increase, and such neat sets, and such neat sets and layouts of various kinds of plugs, from two-stroke engines to racing aeroplane plugs with cooling vanes. So Sam brought one gross of mixed spark plugs and put them with the neat pyramids of puncture outfits, car cleaning brushes and sponges, electric light bulbs and other gadgets that he had bought. The new shells and the showcase looked fine and they waited for customers. Occasionally a labourer on an old push bike called in to have a puncture mended Seeing an advertisement in the local paper for a construction of an iron roof on the gasworks beside the river, they applied for the job, estimated that it would cost them £100 and put in a tender. To their jubilation, they got the contract. Now they'd show what cobbled brothers were made of. Joe, the blacksmith, helped to make some of the ironwork in their new forge. The brothers worked from early in the morning to late at night. It was summer. They sang and whistled at their jobs. They wanted to get the contract finished in time for the joint week of the Culm Stock and Two Rivers Otter Hunts. I too was looking forward to that week of walking, having lunch and tea by wayside inns and careless rides home after, afterwards in the summer evenings. During one lunch hour rest, someone strolled out from the gaswork and said that Surely the sheet iron louvers for the main ventilator in the roof were too thin. Wouldn't they rust in the salt sea wind that someone had someone demanded? Adding the cast iron adding that cast iron would be better, they returned home that evening. The boys consulted the blueprints and specification and found that cast iron was not stipulated, nor for that matter was sheet iron. But it was their first contract and must be absolutely first-class work. They agreed that if the gasworks people wanted a ventilator with cast iron louvers, well, they supposed they ought to have it. So it was ordered from the Bristol foundry, who charged them £60 for it, including the sharpen, to sharpen the wooden mould. It weighed 1,200 weight, and when the gas manager saw it, he declared that the roof was not strong enough to support it. The junior clerk who had made the suggestion of the cast iron did not remember the conversation during the luncheon interview and when the roof was finally on, the boys found that they had lost a £100 in addition to their time as workmen. I knew that was going to happen. I knew <laughs> they were just being so ignorant. Meanwhile, it's going to get worse, isn't it? Meanwhile, they found that they could not work outside all day and also attend to the business side. So the books were not methodically kept. No one was responsible for attending to the post. They did it between them. Replies to letters were intermittent. The man who had originally asked them to make parts for the battery-making machines wrote frenzied letters about the chronic lateness of the dispatch of orders. All three partners drew cheques from the banking account, whether for personal needs, housekeeping or business matters. There was no limit to the withdrawals and no cheque on them until one day the bank manager wrote and said that they were overdrawn and security was there for... And, and, and what security was there for further... Sorry, was overdrawn and what security was there for further overdraft. This was unpleasant. And to escape the unpleasantness, they all went otter hunting. An old friend of the family continued to come over to the works on his motorcycle and to borrow sums of money from the boys. Generously and sympathetically, his requests were always met. Are you, are you getting the signal? I've just suddenly... What was this? Your signal keeps coming and going. The 
is that I is somebody? Sorry, I'm just looking at my phone in case uh, somebody's trying to say that we're not on or something. But I don't think that's it. Um, the time came when half a dozen more summonses for unpaid accounts were lying about in what was called the office, among the letters and bills scattered with catalogues and cigarette ends and parts of models for engineering was still a keen interest in their lives. Since they didn't know what to do about the summonses, they did nothing. For weeks the works had not been working, but they hadn't the heart to stand the men off, so they were still on full pay, including the expensive apprentice. When Letitia and I went to stay with them in August, the position was that all the money had gone, four or five hundred pounds were in debt, and were about to be collected by means of summonses, judgment summonses and writs. I had looked forward to fishing for flatfish and bass in the estuary by the railway bridge all the summer weeks, but something had to be done to help the boys. I knew nothing about business, and I had an aversion to materialism, figures, mathematics, but something had to be done. It was hard to find where to begin, the place was untidy and unorganised, and the books had not been kept latterly. Sam was the only one who concerned himself with bookkeeping. For the last year of his education at the local grammar school, he had played truant, leaving home every morning on his bicycle with a lunch bag and satchel of books strapped on the crossbar. For three terms, his father had thought him to be at school, while the headmaster assumed that he had left. Sam, however, was not lazy. He'd educated himself by reading engineering and electrical books. He dreamed of having the letters A-M-I-E-E -E after his name. Sam's knowledge of bookkeeping was small and based upon courses of instruction by post. After working hours, he sat at a desk in the room adjoining a cosy sitting room and tried to master the principles of double-entry bookkeeping. Through the closed book, sorry, through the closed door in those happy evenings before my marriage, we used to hear his groans, his mild explodents like dash and curse it. Eventually, Sam gave up the course, exchanging into electrical engineering. Sam was a nice boy. I longed to help him. He was always willing and ready to help me to be my companion, to adjust my motorcycle engine, to listen to my short stories as I wrote them, to go for walks and expeditions with me. One day we'd gone to Cranmere Pool on Dartmoor together, walking all day up the Tor Valley, through heather and peat moss, soaking wet in the grey rain. For hours we plodded upwards to look at the place for a description of the two rivers source in Tarka. Uh, that's his, obviously his book. Sam was happy helping anybody in any sort of work, a decent little brother-in-law. I set myself to give him all the help I could. How many summonses and threats were there? No one exactly knew. Some of the dashed little things had been thrown away or burnt. The writ was important. I had £30 in the bank and drew it out. I went round to the people who owed the money and tried to collect it telling the truth. This gave us a week, while costs of stay of execution mounted up. The old family friend who came on his motorbike to see the boys and to get some money from them was met by myself as manager of Cobbold Brothers. An interview in which I said firmly, no more money, but he managed to borrow fiver from me. I totted up the sums in the chequebook counterfoils and found that he had borrowed £150 from the boys. I got a promissory note from the post office and saw that he'd signed it for presentation to the trustees after his death. More judgment summonses arrived with threats of bailiffs. A knockdown sale would be disastrous. All that fine new machinery sold outright by order of the court without advertising. I travelled hundreds of miles on my bicycle with my eldest brother visiting relatives. Would no one lend £150 on a bill of sale? No one would. 
They were sorry, but it was not their affair. Meanwhile, costs of a judgment summons for a vacuum cleaner bought for £13 had mounted to £35. £2 had to be found or the bailiffs were coming in. I made inquiries about the thing. Why had they bought it? It appeared that one day in May a traveller had called and promised Sam a lot of easy money if only he would drive him, the representative of the best vacuum cleaner in the world, to visit Sam's friends in the neighbourhood. So Sam drove him around. At the first house he was reproachfully refused admission by an elderly butler. At the next house they were not at home. At the third house no one answered the bell. The fourth house was occupied by a general, a decent chap, declared... The fourth house was occupied by the general, a decent chap, declared Sam, who went otter hunting. The general told them that his wife was away. In any case, he didn't want a vacuum cleaner. Sam, who was sensitive about the intrusion, was about to retire when the demonstrator asked to be allowed to clean the general's carpets for nothing, with absolutely no obligation. Again, the general said he didn't require such a cleaner. Again, the demonstrator persisted uh, and, and at last was running the machine over the carpets brought back from India. Driving away the machine, the demonstrator told Sam that he had a sure sale there and all Sam had to do was to buy the new cleaner for him for £13 and then sell it to the general for £17, making £4 profit for himself. Sam thought this was a good thing, but before he gave the order, he obtained from the salesman a written statement that he would take back the machine if it was not bought by the general. In due course, the big cardboard box was delivered by a railway van and taken over in the car to the general's. Mrs General said firmly at the door, we did not order it, and we do not want it, and I consider your bringing it over like this a most questionable procedure. Sam stammered an apology and said of course that he would take it away at once, and returned with the unopened box which was put away with the other unsold stuff in the attic. Eventually, the judgment summons and the cost of keeping the bailiffs out had increased the original debt from £13 to £35, pounds. If, and if two pounds were not forthcoming on the morrow, the bailiffs would enter. Without saying a word, Sam went to Exeter in his car and returned in the afternoon with two pounds. How did you get it, Sam? Sam replied modestly, Oh, I had an idea. I pawned the beastly thing. What? The vacuum cleaner? For two pounds? Sam nodded. All that morning I'd been trying to make some sort of order of the works, sweeping the machine room, making piles of catalogues, bills, accounts, and also cleaning the new lavatory which the workman, now dismissed, had left in an unbearable condition. I cleaned the bathroom in the house too, for no one but myself seemed to be affected by the marks of ancient washing and having worked through the lunch hour in a desperate fury at the complacency around me, I felt immense frustration of rage intensified by the complete loneliness, for there seemed no point of contact anywhere in my way... There, there was no point of contract, contact in my way of thinking and theirs. Here was Sam, holding out for two pound notes, his usual in his usual diffidence mingled with a certain air of pride, for he could not save the situa... Sorry, here was Sam holding out two pound notes. His usual diffidence mingled with a certain air of pride, for had he not saved the situation by pawning the vacuum cleaner? I could bear it... I couldn't bear it any longer. I do not remember what I said or shouted at them, but they looked startled and bewildered. In the days that followed, having sent Sam back to Exeter with the two pounds to get the cleaner, which was not legally their property, 
I told them, I was in despair and exhausted by haranguing them continually, trying to get them to see a different viewpoint, to use self-criticism to destroy their old selves and to build a new conception of life. They didn't know what I meant, and perhaps I was foolish to think that they could think for themselves, or what I had done or what I believed for myself, rejected the past that all had blossomed, or rather had come to... What? rejected all the past that had blossomed, or rather had come to a pox in the Great War. This was the theme of the book I was writing about an ex-soldier, and it arose from my own life. Of course I lacked experience, even as they did. An, immer an emotional urging was useless to them and harmful to me. The situation was desperate, was most curiously... The situation which was desperate was most curiously solved... The very next morning, when the eldest boy calm, calmly announced to me that he'd been left £3,000 the month before by the death of an aunt, adding that he could not get it as the solicitors had not sent the cheque yet. This is a, a, such a huge a by the way, should I work with Sam, and then this hugely involved potted history it's most it's most bizarre i'm just trying to keep my head on there and i'm i'm sort of paraphrasing things but anyway let's we're nearly at the end of this bit for over a month i'd been rushing about trying to borrow money to pay rent to what does that say to oh sorry there's a mark on the word trying to borrow money to prevent them from being made bankrupt. For a month, the judgment summonses had been mounting up in almost geometrical progression, and all the while, the money was available among themselves. I felt quite light-headed. Half an hour later, having lodged proof of this inheritance, an overdraft was arranged at the bank, and there was general rejoicing at the end of the crisis. I went fishing alone in the estuary, grieving at the change that my behaviour had caused in the happiness of the household. I had done nothing to alter things. I was foolish to have interfered. And now there was a rift, perhaps forever. The two younger boys emigrated to South Africa, working their passages as stewards on an emigrant's ship. The eldest brother remained remained buying a new car and enjoying himself by learning to fly an aeroplane. About a year or two, about a year after the two brothers had departed and the works were standing idle, the general came to buy a vacuum cleaner. He would like help in a small way, he said, by giving an order for one. Ernest said there was a second-hand one somewhere in the storeroom, and of course it was an old model, although it hadn't been used except for one demonstration. This was the cleaner that had cost £37, and heaven knows what a waste of nervous life, and Ernest sold it for, to the general for 30 shillings. This was years ago, before Letitia's papa died, and the mortgage for and the mortgages foreclosed, and Ernest joined his brothers, being a good mechanic, and soon got a good job. It was years ago, but I didn't seem able to forget it. This night, for example, I lay in bed, past scenes moved brokenly in my mind, and with them feelings of fear, hope, and exaltation, and happiness, that Sam and I would be friends again, and then doubt once more and the vivid past recreating itself from the cells of my brain which had been impressed in 1925 that had made me writhe in torment at my failure. How they had hated my interference, for it had, for it had been interference. Why had I interfered? I hadn't known where to begin. Everything had been wrong, muddled, all contrary to the law of economics and creative life. In vain I tried to convince myself that it had been a fragment of an England in decline, the inevitable end of inherited wealth in a family unprepared for life, so that it was foolish or at least illogical to expect spiritual awareness of music, poetry, art and literature in such condition. Now, if Sam, 
whom Letitia loved dearly, came home again to the England that he loved dearly. His letters were full of longing to see England again, and we all worked together after two or three years. The farm would be in order, and I could hand it over to the care of... And I could hand... And I could... And... I could hand it and the care of the family over to them and be free to move about and so to rid myself of the material responsibilities for which years had been slowing, slowly stifling me as an artist. I wasn't equipped to deal with such things. An artist needs periods of freedom and irresponsibility in the true sense of the word in order to prepare himself for the next leap or act of creation. Every hour of actual writing should be preceded by at least six hours of mental freedom, of relaxation, while the subconscious mind was working. I wanted to write more books. They'd been waiting within my hidden mind for many years now. A year of hard physical work on the farm, with Sam as eventual business manager, and I would be strong and well again, and I should be able to write without any subjective feeling for all the past would be cleared up. Sam would see me in different eyes. He would know the cause of the exasperated feeling of the old days, and he would be well, and all would be well between us. The ghost of that sad time would be laid to stalk no more in memory, which is part of human life. I lay awake, I lay awake happily until my thought went along another tract of remembrance and ended in my mother lying in the nursing home, and soon I was back again in the scenes of the Great War, which had risen inevitably out of the, re the repossessions of European man. So much work to be done to alter the entire way of thinking in England. Someone must do it, otherwise another war was inevitable, with the same old slogans of vice versus versus virtue, brutality against humanity, right against the might, while in the crater zones and on the frigid seas ignorant poor men die in agony. I was used to such night torments since early childhood. The period usually went on two or three hours before peace came and then I could sleep. About this time I discovered that a glass of hot milk taken at night kept the ghosts of memory from rising in the midnight dark. Especially was the thermos flask by my bedside welcome in the week. Especially was the... Well, he's written that in a very strange way, and it's my last sentence. Especially, I'm going to re-paraphrase it. Especially welcome was the thermos flask by my bedside in the weeks following the death of my mother. Especially was the... Yeah, he's just put welcome in a funny place. My God, that was hard work. That was hard work. Anyway, all of that, he does seem to overwrite somewhat, does this chap, Henry Williamson. And fascinating, I mean, a great a side note. <laughs> but it hasn't advanced to set one iota into buying this farm. But, yeah, so we know the backstories. There's a huge amount of backstory there. Uh, sorry, I was reading a bit flitty on that, but I'm gonna I'm gonna probably end it there because we're now on chapter six, called "I Become More Involved." Uh, thank God that's a, a shorter chapter. But excuse me, but that seemed uh, that seemed hard work. Uh, Turbo says there's a mug born every minute. Bloody door to door salesman. Ha. Huh. We'll have to catch up. On his phone, the stream is OK. Oh, good. My signal keeps coming and going. We were mesmerised by it. So there we go. He's uh, So from what I gleaned from that, Sam, Letitia's brother, younger brother, as a young man, I can't... His, they weren't his parents. They, they were all brothers. Well, it was just a, he was a young brother and they were older brothers and they were engineers who made parts for a battery firm using a treadle lathe and then they thought wouldn't it be great if we had electric or a, a mechanical a, a, a petrol lathe so we could do be better things 
and they had a little bit of money inherited to them and they thought well what we need is a workshop so they built this workshop and then they seemed to just think that they could spend money left right and center and assume the work was going to come in and the work didn't really come in and they then there was this business with the wash the uh hoover or the vacuum cleaner <laughs> there's a nice touch how much of this is true but it was a nice touch that the general then came back years later and says, I actually, I would like to buy a vacuum cleaner. I understand you sell them. And it, it, he sold him the same vacuum cleaner that he had demonstrated four or five years earlier. That's amazing. And he, Sandel says, and the publisher thought that only one chapter was a bit off subject. <laughs> ha! Ha! Yeah, exactly. Uh, Turbo Streams thought those thought of all those finances to cock what a mess then underestimate a ten and underestimated a tender i mean that must you know that that must go on even now all the time it's so easy i mean when i used to do my corporate videoing people would say how much does how much do you charge and you it's a very difficult thing i had a council contact me and they wanted to know how much a 30 second advertisement would cost and and I said well what's it about and it was to do with the bins they wanted to tell people I think they wanted to remind people to put the bins out on a certain day something like that this was about 15 years ago and so I said okay what's you know 30 seconds so you think well i could probably i could do that um for a day's you know for a day's filming and a day's editing which i could you know do it from i don't know, three to five hundred pounds then they said well it's it's going to be played at the cinema so i thought oh okay so that's different then because it needs to be either shot on video and then transferred to film or shot on film but it depends how you're going to tell that story. For example, you might just have a bloke in front of the camera saying, I'm from the council. We want to just remind everybody, instead of collecting the bins on Wednesday, we're going to be collecting them on Friday. All right. And you could do that in 30 seconds. One shot, bloke, point and shoot, easy. Or you could go the other extreme and have a crane looking down a street and on this the crane comes down very very slowly from above a house comes down very very slowly and you see a whole street with the half a dozen dustbin men driving up their lorries and people coming out and all that and people coming out of their houses and putting their rubbish out onto the doorstep and the crane just comes slowly so like this is a camera on the crane comes down very very slowly like this to rest on a bin in the foreground and as the camera comes down and rests on the bin in the foreground a bloke comes in and grabs that and puts it in the back of the truck and the timing and all so it might take a whole day to shoot it and a, and a, and a week to organize it and that might cost you to hire the crane to do and the camera and everything it might cost you 50 grand you know who knows so my point to the council was yeah it can cost you 500 to 50 grand what's your budget and i didn't get the job <laughs> thank god thank god i didn't get the job because they didn't know they didn't know what they wanted they had no idea they just said how much for a video how much yeah how much is a piece of string depends what you want to do with it i used to get I worked for a radio station and they wanted a testimonial video once. Well, I did loads of these, loads and loads and loads of these. But one one of the radio stations, they said, we want to do this testimonial for our clients who advertise on the radio station. And they said, but we, we've got a fleet of minis, which we um, we want to draw, you know, which have got our radio name on it. And they said, um, what we want to do 
is have them featured at the beginning of this video. Bear in mind, this video is about two and a half minutes long and it's really just four clients saying, oh yeah, the best thing about advertising on the radio is it gets my name in the community. Oh, they're very cheap and it goes on here. All those sort of things. That's what they wanted them to say. But they wanted to start with these minis. And so the client then said to me, sis, what would be great is if we can make this a bit top gear. And I said, top gear. OK, so top gear, again, they might be spending something like 50 to 100,000 pounds an episode for top gear. OK, a lot of that's gone on the presenters and the, there would be something like 20 to 50 crew members. I, you don't think of these things, but there was a very stylized way of shooting the cars um, with camera cars and all of this and then there was all this post-production that they would do to make the colour grading quite amazing and it made it very very sexy to look at even though it was just simply cars going up motorways so they would have cars going up motorways and they would have there is a motorway which is shut off nobody can actually go on this motorway and it's used for a lot of filming um, or they would go on real motorways and then they would have to go at certain times where they could, you know, on certain roads, they would have to close that road so they could film on it. So no, and have other cars look like real cars. There's a lot of tricks that go into all of this. So I said, well, have you got £100,000 to spend on it? And they said, what do you mean? hundred thousand? No, we just want it. I said, well, it will never look quite like Top Gear then, but I will do my best to make it Top Gear-ish, but it won't be because they were paying me something like £700 to film everything and put it together and edit it. And that's all they... And, you know, they had no budget for this at all. And, and, I, and I was cheap. I was cheap. Most other people would say, yeah, that's about three or £4,000, but I was cheap, and that's why I kept getting the work. And I was good as well. Anyway, so I said, but you've got three minis. Why don't we make it more like the Italian job? That just seemed to me, you know, absolutely. And they could get the rights to the music because they're a radio station. They had PR, PRS uh, and uh, perform. No, it was the mechanical rights thing, the copyright. So they could get the license to the music. They wouldn't have to pay quite so much. Uh, plus the fact it was being shown privately just in a um, conference thing. So it wasn't public. So it would be very cheap to have the music. And you could get the, the Self-Preservation Society music. We are the Self-Preservation Society. So, and they said, oh, we hadn't thought of that. And I thought, you know, never mind Top Gear. Let's let's do something with that. So i just trying to remember where this was. I think it was in, um, what is the one, the the one with the Lady Cadaver place? Uh, not Lady Cadaver, because that's uh, Coventry. But the other place, Banbury, Banbury. Banbury Cross, ride a cock horse to Banbury Cross um, to see a fine lady. That was what I was thinking. I think it was for Banbury FM that was. They're no longer Banbury. They're now part, well, whether they're there or not, who knows. So there were a couple of humpback bridges and a couple of old buildings. And so I, we just went out for a morning. I said, look, this is going to take, you know, they had no time. They said, how long will it take, though? You know, they wanted this Top Gear effect. And I said, well, Top Gear would take all day to do, you know, a couple of shots like this. And they said, oh, well, we can only really, you know, we've got the clients to fit in and we, we've only got about an hour. Anyway, so I, I said, well, let's, what locations have we got? And they said, well, there's the old Humpback Bridge and there's this and there's that. So I said, fine. So anyway, we... We just had to film it. Luckily, these were quiet roads, and we just had, you know, these cars coming over because they, were, the, the reps were driving it, and and whilst they did drive, some of them were keen to drive fast, and others weren't. They were, you know, they were just not stunt drivers. <laughs> they might have thought they were, but they were reps, you know, middle-aged people. <laughs> who go pootling along in their minis as, as radio reps for the company. And there was me saying, OK, I'm going to do this low shot. I want you to f come right at me. I don't want you to hit me. And, I, and you've got to be you've got to be at least six foot behind each car, but no further and no closer, because I want you to go vroom, vroom, vroom like this. 
and then I want to see at the at the humpback bridge. I want you know. They couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. So in the end, you just got very bland shots of these cars coming, and I would speed it up. 700 quid, you know, that's the difference between having a stunt driver driving a thing with cameras, GoPros and things all over the car or special cameras that they would have and a, and a drone and all of this. And how much? How much? So under quoting for a job, so easy. Sorry, all of that was a little bit um, thing. Sounds like modern printers. They want yesterday for tuppence, says, yeah, I remember... I remember when I worked in the printers, everybody wants it, you know, they they want it yesterday, and but they, won't, they can't give you, oh no, we can't give you the artwork, or we can't give you the logo until about five o'clock, but can we have it in the morning? It's like, wait, you can't give me the logo, and you want 50,000 of these things, and you want them by the morning in full colour separation printing on glossy eggshell 120 GSM, and you want it dry <laughs> and you want it in the morning what planet are you living on uh it, it's like yeah we would get this so like when it, when i was in the entertainment industry juggling and unicycling and fire eating and all those sort of things at corporate events and i'd have one in london they say oh yeah we, we we want you to do your fire eating and we want you to do that thing where you balance on a big ball and you juggle your knives and all of that and you go yeah okay I can do that. And then you'd, that you'd turn up and they say, oh, no, sorry, there's no parking here. And it would be, you want me, but you don't want me here. It's like, well, no, we want you, but you can't park it. You'll have to park. And they said, well, the nearest parking is almost half a mile away. I've got this dirty great big ball you want me to balance on. And you want me juggling and blowing fire at the entrance. And you don't have a changing room. You don't have somewhere where I can put this stuff. And I can't park... How am I going to carry this stuff? Oh, well, you just have to walk it down. And it's like, you want this, but you, you don't want to help me do it. Well, it. I in the end, I hated it. I hated it because I wanted to give a good job. But these idiots, they just, nobody, and the, my agent, who was there as a magician, he was a magician and ran this agency. And I said to him, Nick, I said, they want me to do all this. There's nowhere to change. And I'm in ordinary clothes and I need to dress into my, you know, costume. There's nowhere to change other than the toilet, the men's gents. Y you know, who wants to change in the men's gents where they're urinating against the wall? Nobody, and, you know, you're changing and there's people coming in there, they're zipping their fly and whipping it out. It's like, no, thank you. I don't want to change in there. I'd like just a quiet little office. Broom cupboard will do. I just don't want people weeing in the same room that I'm changing in and getting ready. Thank you. And this agent, Nick, who said, oh, I'm 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 here as a magician. I'm not here as the agent. You left to talk to my wife. They they were a husband and wife and they ran the agency together. And I said, but you're here. Can you not have a word with him? You're the agent. And he said, no. Uh, no, talk to my wife uh, and ring, you know, talk to her. She'll ring and talk to them on the phone and try and negotiate something. And on that particular job, I said, Nick, you're here. You are the agents. It's your name that's the agency. I won't say the name for obvious reasons. And he said, yeah, but no, I I'm just here as a jobbing magician. I don't, you know, you'd have to talk to whatever his wife's now. I can't remember her name now. And, and I said, Nick, if you don't sort something, I'm going home, you know, nobody wants me here I want to do a job I want to earn the money but actually I don't care I'm just going to go home and I walked away in the end I just walked away because I just and then then he came running afterwards and he says oh I've, I've spoken to them and it's it, we've found you an office and all the rest of it by then I didn't want to do it I really didn't I did do it I came back because I didn't want to leave them in the lurch but I was prepared to go home and I just thought bastards you know you just you just don't know how to do it ah reading with a bonus rent yes <laughs> oh dear oh dear anyway enough of this nonsense sorry about that thank you very much for joining me this afternoon I must go and light the se now and get some food hopefully my chicken is defrosted and i will be back tomorrow to read hopefully he can get on to buying the farm and telling us what it's like 
Uh, just before I go, uh, what else have we got here? Had to look at the TV credits to see how many folks makes TV in a TV show. Oh, yes. I mean, so many folks. Um, especially, the, you know, the, 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 the very big successful shows. So much. I mean, they sell them all around the world, so they're making millions from it. Um, what else have we got here? Jeff Kellison. Hello, Jeff. Says, had to unload a trailer and miss the whole show. Um, Julia says, uh, was good. You're great. Thank you, Julia. Ben Reeve says, I've had to lo lose my licence. I have lost... I have lost my license before passing the test. Oh, reminds me of one of those dad's customers offering me my first driving lesson. Some bloke called Penty something I can't read in 98. Rally GB champion. Uh, now, I know a woman, and I don't want to say her name, who has passed her test, her driving test, twice. Work that bit out. You do a driving test. You've passed, madam. Oh, great. And then, not for any... F well, she passed her test twice. She passed her test. But she didn't know that she had to send off the form they gave her to get the full driving licence. So she went on with a provisional licence, which went out of date, joined a company, worked for this company for something like 15 years... And then the company, and was driving company cars, basically uninsured at this point because she hadn't got a full licence. And then the company decided they would have a new fleet of cars and they would change their insurance policy and everyone's name had to go in there and they had to provide their driving licence. And she didn't know where her driving licence was because she didn't actually have one. So then she had to go and take a test a second time and so she was driving around in the fleet with a fleet of, as a rep, for 15 years. Then she had to take this test. She didn't want anyone to know. So she was driving with as on learner plates with an instructor for like a week to boost up her thing so she could pass the second test. And she was just hoping that nobody would see it was her in a learner car that she had been driving for 15 years. And then she took the test again and passed so that she could send off the form this time and get her driving license so that she could hand it in at the company. And what got me is nobody looked at the license and went, gosh, you've only just passed. But she got away with it. You couldn't make it up. You couldn't make it up. Anyway, there we go. Another, another funny little story that came to mind. Take care. Look after yourselves. And I will see you if you're watching The Vogue Show at uh, 8 o'clock on The Vogue Show channel. Uh, welcome along. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.